This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Tom Cruise accepts another impossible mission in Dead Reckoning Part 1. After a Russian stealth submarine is sunk, two halves of a cruise form key go missing with every major power in the world looking for them as they lead to a sentient AI known as the Entity that they each hope to control. Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt and his team, including Simon Pegg's Benji Dunn, Ving Rhames Luther and Rebecca Ferguson's Ilsa Faust are pursuing the keys, hoping it can lead to destroying the Entity, but their mission is disrupted by Pickpocket Grace, played by Hayley Atwell. Ethan soon realises the Entity will do anything to protect itself using a ruthless enemy from Ethan's pre-IMF past, Gabriel Plover S.A. Morales, to work on its behalf, who Ethan must protect Grace from and prevent from obtaining the two halves. Well, one summer on after the largely being Chris who was saving cinema itself with Top Gun Maverick, Tom Cruise is back with the seventh entry in the Mission Impossible film franchise, of course spun off from the television series. And I do have to admit that I have a bit of a personal affinity for the Mission Impossible film series in that it was one of the things that got me into cinema when I was a kid. I remember when I was about five years old, there was a tape of summer 1996 movie trailers. And of course, the very first one on the tape was for Mission Impossible. And I remember really wanting to see that movie, and I did several months later when it came out on VHS and I could rent it out from the library. And for its beginnings, it was almost like each director brought something different to each film, in that Brian De Palma made one, John Woo made one, and J.J. Abrams made one, and they were all very different from each other. And some of the seeds of what we know the Mission Impossible film franchise now were sown in Abrams' movie, but really the formula didn't solidify until Ghost Protocol. And that can largely be credited to the inclusion of Christopher McQuarrie as a co-writer. McQuarrie and Cruise are very tight-knit. They're very creatively in sync. McQuarrie starts out as merely being a writer on movies like The Usual Suspects, and then he became Cruise's regular rewrite man, someone that would be brought in to effectively iron out any issues with the script and tailor them for Cruise. And he's still in that position, but by the time of Rogue Nation, he'd also moved into the director's chair as well. And certainly between that and Fallout, McQuarrie is an accomplished action director. Mission Impossible Fallout in particular is one of those adrenaline pumping action movies of the last decade. That is a genuine white knuckle movie and certainly felt like the culmination of everything the franchise has been doing up until that point. So now we have Dead Reckoning, which is a two-part story. This is basically a summer of part ones in terms of blockbusters. The bar now for Tom Cruise is so high between Fallout and Top Gun Maverick, the question becomes whether or not him and Macquarie can actually outdo themselves, whether they can really put audiences on the edge of their seats. And it almost feels like it's starting to become an impossible mission all by itself but they damn sure give it a try. This latest Mission Impossible movie feels especially timely and relevant because it taps into a lot of fears that we have about AI. AI is something that is very much emerging at this present moment, and people are worried about it. They're concerned that it might be misused or abused in some way, and certainly I don't believe it's anywhere near as powerful as the entity in this movie, but there is a rich vein of digital paranoia running all throughout Dead Reckoning, which of course makes sense in the espionage world, where it's all about data and intelligence and surveillance and guarding that. And of course, if you've got something that harvests that data constantly, that becomes a hugely powerful threat. You see in the background of the events of this movie, each of the individual surveillance agencies are having to effectively go analog, switch off away from their servers and computers and go back to old-fashioned methods that they've largely 
abandoned just because they're so worried about everything slipping into the entity's control. It's effectively a new Cold War where the artillery and threat isn't missiles, it's data. And so everyone's scrambling around to try and find the two halves of this key because they hope it leads to the source of the entity so they can seek to control it. Because he, who has command of the data, controls the world. The thing is though, what they seem to have missed is that the moment that it became self-aware, it was impossible to control the entity once again. So while everyone else is racing around, you've got Ethan and his team also hunting down the keys, but because they want to destroy the entity. Because Ethan realizes this is more power than one state or one person can really hold. And so long as the entity exists, it is a threat. Some of the tensest and scariest scenes with the NC are actually the ones that feel strangely plausible in their own way. While few of us will get in a scenario where we have to defuse a nuclear bomb in an airport like Benji does, a lot of us will probably relate to the fact the bomb keeps asking Benji exceptionally personal questions about himself and his identity, trying to build a profile around him. I'm sure many of us have done that online at one point or another with a bit less stakes about it, and Benji has no choice but to comply, otherwise it might go off. But of course, the real queasy, unsettling part about that entire scene is the fact that, really, it already knows the answers. It doesn't need his input, it knows them already. And technology has always been a big part of Mission Impossible. Ever since the Bond films, gadgets have been a requisite of the spy genre, and we used to look upon those as being aspirational, as things that we'd like to have in the future. Now that we have a lot of it, we're starting to become increasingly unsettled by it. And in Dead Reckoning, over the course of it, the IMF team discover that their technological tools become broken, unreliable, or corrupted over the course of the narrative, either by the entity or just simply not being reliable in a bind. And so you have moments where characters are tracking one another and then suddenly the map will change and they can't determine whether or not that's true. Or someone might be talking to someone over a radio and then suddenly their voice gets replaced by their own but they're not actually speaking those words because they're being impersonated. Again, that is a deeply chilling moment in this movie because that could actually happen. AI voice impersonation is one of those things that we are actually concerned about at this point in time. Even the series trademark of Mars can't be trusted. The machine that makes them breaks down and it can't be fixed. It's finished, done, kaput. And they have to rewrite their entire plan on the fly. The IMF team have to ensure their digital conveniences and rely more on their analog skills, especially their own wit and ingenuity. And that raises the stakes and the tension even further. And in the midst of all this, you've got Ethan, who is almost always presented as a nearly infallible moral bellwether. He's not someone that chooses a side. He picks his course of what's right and pursues it to the bitter end. And while it means that Ethan has never been a particularly complicated character, because he's always the good guy and the hero in every situation, Hunt does act that way because he acts out of protecting those around him and putting himself in harm's way if necessary to do that. He's not going to put other lives on the line if he can't put his own before them. And that means that Ethan is the biggest threat to an entity which has no conscience in that same way. The entity doesn't work in that kind of emotional sense like Ethan does. But having said all that, the AI entity might actually be one of the weaker elements of Dead Reckoning in that something that is so enormous and shapeless is very hard to root against as an antagonist. We do get some visual representations of it as a kind of circular screensaver, but it's not really very tangible as a villain on screen. Understandably, the filmmakers have brought in a secondary main antagonist in the form of Gabriel, who is meant to be linked to Ethan's past. He's meant to be a crucial reason why he joined the IMF in the first place and accepted those missions. That's obviously something that they're going to come back to in the second part of this story, but we get little tidbits of it 
here. The problem is it's not really enough to give Gabriel more of an identity as a character. And I do think that the Mission Impossible series has actually had some pretty good villains over the course of its run, particularly lately when you had Henry Cavill and Sean Harris in Fallout and Rogue Nation, respectively. Whereas here, I think that S.A. Morales, certainly he's got a lot of charm and charisma on screen and they've given him that little signature trademark of having the two knives but it just feels like he's there largely for some for Ethan to physically fight against. There is something interesting about the idea that he's the AI's chosen actor and probably done so because of his links to Ethan but Gabriel also has a kind of zealotry fervor about him, that he completely believes in this AI. There's that moment where he's actually in a chamber, having been physically connected to the entity, and it almost feels like he has kind of like a religious experience. I wish there was a bit more of that, because honestly, as it stands, Gabriel feels quite underdeveloped as a character, largely just an amalgamation of generic villainous tropes a lot of the time, and I don't think it helps that he's connected to the AINC because it makes it feel like that he's simply a puppet, that he's simply a tool, which yes he is, but does actually diminish his threat as a villain overall. And I don't think this is really an issue with Morales' performance, he's trying. The problem is that he isn't given all that much with the script to work with. If there is a villain that does actually steal the show, it's Pom Clementis Paris, despite the fact that the character is virtually silent throughout the entire movie. But Clementis infuses the role with this very oddball energy that makes the character intriguing, especially in the quieter moments where you get those subtle gestures and eccentricities that she adds into the part, but then you've got other moments like the car chase in Rome where she's smashing around through things willy-nilly with that truck, and she looks like she's having the time of her life, screaming and yelling at the top of her lungs, so you get these real kind of extremes and layers to this performance, but then you've got an arc to this character as well. It does does seem like the character has a little bit of a journey throughout the movie, which is nice to see. Clementine really elevates a role that could have been forgettable in most people's hands and actually makes it a quite striking element, despite the fact that she doesn't have a whole lot of screen time. And as far as everything else, it's the Mission Impossible show you've come to expect. Cruz and Macquarie have almost got things down to a fine art. All the elements are here and are just the right quantities and at the right moments. Everything feels perfectly bad. Balance. And for a two and a half hour movie, it absolutely breezes by. It doesn't feel anywhere near as long as it actually is. And I was going to say that the Mission Impossible franchise feels a bit minimalist by this point, but I don't think that's really the right word. I think it's more efficient and economical, especially in terms of its narrative and plotting, in that there is just the right amount of it to hang all the film together, but not enough that it gets in the way of the action, because the plot in Mission Impossible movies largely exists to tie together extended set pieces, and it does that well, but Macquarie also has a good intuition of knowing when you need the dialogue to actually tell the audience something, and when, really, you just rely on a look, you rely on the visual language of cinema, there are scenes that don't have any dialogue and are very quick on screen, but convey enough information for the audience to get a sense of the characters' relationships. That's good economical storytelling. And the team dynamic feels stable and works really well. You've got Simon Pegg as Benji, the tech expert slash field agent that often serves as an audience surrogate. There's a bit of an everyman quality to Pegg's performance, but also he's really risen to the challenge as the part has got expanded with each passing movie. And Pegg, I think, is actually one of the franchise's great assets. But also you've got Ving Rhames as Luther, the other tech expert who's a bit more old school, which actually comes in handy over the course of this adventure. But Reigns has been serving in this franchise as long as Cruz has, and because of that, him being a mainstay means that there's a bit of resonance to his scenes with Cruz, particularly that big moment where he talks about what's your objective and reminds Ethan of what his principles should be in that moment. He almost serves 
as Ethan's conscience. But the addition of Hayley Atwell as Grace is a very welcome one. Atwell has always struck me as one of those performers that's been a little bit underappreciated. She's never gotten her proper due up until now. And that's not to say that she hasn't been liked in the past. People loved her as Agent Carter in the MCU, and she was great in the first Avenger and in the spin-off television series, but they never seemed to translate into leading lady status like you would expect it to. And here, finally being elevated elevated to that, she works beautifully with Cruz. There's a real playfulness to their dynamic, and that is the anchor throughout the entirety of the film. In fact, Atwell steals great chunks of Dead Reckoning. There's a lot of scenes that hinge entirely on Atwell alone, especially in the third act. And Grace adds a bit of volatility to the proceedings because she's an outsider. She's someone that's kind of stumbled into this world and she doesn't quite realise what she's gotten herself into. She's out of her depth, but she's someone that's had to always rely upon herself. She was an orphan, and she became a criminal as a way of supporting herself. And so over the course of the movie, she has to learn to trust Ethan and his team and actually work with them as opposed to against them. But in the first half of the movie, she's an especially slippery character, where she's always looking for some kind of quick escape or some way of getting out of a situation. Atwell and Cruz have this great great push and pull between them. It almost feels a bit kind of Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn in that kind of way. And Atwell is charming and likeable, as you would expect from someone that knows how to use those to their advantage, but also manages to make the character someone that you can actually empathise with. I think that Atwell is one of the big strengths of this movie. But the presence of Grace comes at a disadvantage to Rebecca Ferguson's Ilsa Faust, and I don't think the filmmakers ever really knew what to do with this character. They brought her back, and Ferguson is great in the role as per usual and she does get some moments to shine but it never feels like the character is properly connected with this story it always feels like she's a bit superfluous to the proceedings and i think that's because grace and ilsa do have a lot of shared attributes with each other in that they're both kind of wily characters and they're both kind of thief-like they're a little bit too similar to each other and so that means that ilsa doesn't feel like she has a place in this particular outing. And I think the filmmakers were aware of this because they kind of hint that her and Ethan have this kind of romantic chemistry. I don't think I really buy that. I don't think that was really there in the last two movies. I think that's trying to give a little bit of purpose to that character, but it doesn't really work. And honestly, I think it might have been a better idea if they took Ilsa out of this story altogether and just kept her for part two. But unfortunately, that's not what they do. And really, I felt a little bit dissatisfied with how they use Ferguson in this movie. But the big central attraction is Tom Cruise himself, one of the last of the old school movie stars. And I'm sure the fact this has a digital versus analog plotline similar to Top Gun Maverick has caused many people to compare it to Cruise fighting to keep cinema going alive in an era of streaming, but also doing physical stunts instead of relying on digi doubles to do the action for him, but simply put, Cruz has responded to an era of spectacle by turning himself into the spectacle. You go to a Tom Cruise movie to see whatever death-defying stunt he's going to do next. He is literally putting himself on the line for our entertainment. And because we as audience members know that, that adds a sense of jeopardy to all the action set pieces. It makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up knowing that Cruz is actually doing a lot of this stuff legitimately for real. And in Dead Reckoning, we have the stunt that is in all the marketing materials where Cruz rides that bike off a cliff and parachutes down. And that was one of the very first things they shot, just in case Cruz did actually kill himself doing that but certainly it's an absolutely jaw-dropping moment to see that actually happen before your eyes and also there is the fact that Cruz as we sometimes forget is actually a very good actor you especially see it in the scenes that he has with Henry Cerny as Kittredge. Kittredge finally brought back in this installment I've been waiting for this character to come back because those confrontations between the two in the original Brian De Palma Mission Impossible were absolutely 
absolute dynamite and they're great in this movie it's a fantastic reunion but certainly the addition of Kittredge also makes me think that there are deliberate callbacks to the original Mission Impossible especially in that final act with the train set piece that's very similar to the finale of that movie but certainly that's on steroids by comparison in the yes you get a fight on top of the train but now it's a knife battle and that's not even the final action set piece in the film in fact that whole last act of the movie is pretty much entirely set on the train and it has so many complex elements and variables to it you've also got Vanessa Kirby as the White Widow who is the daughter of Max from the original 1996 film played by Vanessa Redgrave and Kirby fits into those shoes beautifully she was great in that small role in Fallout here she actually has expanded upon even further and she's quite pivotal to the last act of this movie set on the train much like how Max was in the original 1996 film so you've got that callback there as well. The set pieces are so well directed and handled, managing to sustain their tension and excitement across 15 to 20 minutes at a time. You got that car chase in Rome where they're running around in the Fiat 500 and Grace and Ethan are handcuffed to each other and that is especially fun and I feel like the franchise knows when to have a sense of humour about itself. There's a little bit of a sly wit in that the characters know that Ethan is always going off road at some point or another or there's that moment where the Fiat 500 rolls down the steps and the characters somehow swap places with each other that's kind of cartoony and a bit wily coyote in the absolute right ways. It does feel a little bit derivative of Fast X, which also had a big car chase sequence around Rome, but if you take it in isolation, it's still brilliantly done. And then you've got the set piece in Venice, all the chase with multiple characters running around the various narrow streets that get increasingly claustrophobic. And then you've got that fight scene in that extremely narrow alley with E. Ethan. The actors barely have room to move and yet it's so kind of lithe and flexible and certainly feels really, really hemmed in. And then you got the big finale with the train and especially that last beat where they're just trying to outrun the train carriages as they collapse off a bridge. And that is just several excellent stunt scenes just back to back to back with each other. And yes, there are a couple of weird spots of editing where it does does feel like they deliberately made the escapes even tighter in post-production by kind of cutting away early and so you got these kind of jump cuts as Ethan escapes that sometimes feel a little bit jarring but certainly add to the adrenaline levels. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is a brilliant action movie as you've come to expect from the Mission Impossible franchise by now. Is it my personal favourite out of the entire series? I would actually say no. I still think that Fallout has this movie be, especially in terms of sheer crazy bonkers stunts and I did have some issues with the writing here but even so that shouldn't diminish from what has actually been accomplished here. The movie is still chock-a-block with absolutely top-notch action from start to finish that is genuinely exhilarating. And I also appreciated that this is the first half in a two-part saga, but it feels like a movie that functions onto itself. It has a proper three-act structure, and it has an ending that, while not totally conclusive, it does still have threads left hanging for that second film. It does have some degree of resolution. It does have closure at the very end of it that makes it feel satisfying. And honestly, they probably could have gone away with calling this a solo sequel because there are many franchises that have sequels that are clearly designed to set up into other installments. It kind of feels a little bit like that. Cruz and Macquarie are still a brilliant and formidable filmmaking duo. And certainly, this is something that you really need to see on the big screen and get that proper adrenaline rush out of it. And I look forward to seeing how they manage to somehow outdo themselves 
in the second half. You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the color tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review and you want to support my work, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature which is right below the video. Or you can buy some of my merch from my T Public page. Or you can join my Patreon where you can see my videos early among other perks including access to my Discord server or you can simply like, share and subscribe. The choice is yours. Until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. This video will self-destruct in... Now.